An excerpt from Homesick by Jean Fritz. In my father's study, there was a large globe with all the countries of the world running around it. I could put my finger on the exact spot where I was and had been ever since I'd been born. And I was on the wrong side of the globe. I was in China in a city named Hong Kao, a dot on a crooked line that seemed to break the country right in two. The line was really the Yangtze River, but who would know by looking at a map what the Yangtze River really was? Orange-brown, muddy mustard colored, and wide, 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 with a river smell that was old and came all the way up from the bottom. Sometimes old women knelt on the river bank, begging the river god to return a son or grandson who may have drowned. They would wail and beat the earth to make the river god pay attention. But I knew how busy the river god must be. All those people on the Yangtze River. Coolies hauling water. Women washing clothes. Houseboats swarming with old people. Young chickens. Pigs. Big crooked sailed junks with eyes painted on their prows so they could see where they were going. I loved the Yangtze River, but of course, I belonged on the other side of the world, in America, with my grandmother. Twenty-five fluffy little yellow chicks hatched from our eggs today, my grandmother wrote. I wrote my grandmother that I had watched a Chinese magician swallow three yards of fire. The trouble with living on the wrong side of the world was I didn't feel like a real American. For instance, I could never be president of the United States. I didn't want to be president. I wanted to be a writer. Still, why should there be a law saying that only a person born in the United States could be president? It was as though I wouldn't be American enough. Actually, I was American every minute of the day, especially during school hours. I went to a British school, and every morning we sang God Save the King. Of course, the British school children loved singing about their gracious king. Ian Forbes stuck out his chest and sang as if he were saving the king all by himself. Everyone sang, even Gina Boss, who was Italian, and Vera Sebastian, who was so Russian she dressed the way Russian girls did long ago, before the revolution, when her family had to run away to keep from being killed. But I wasn't Vera Sebastian. I asked my mother to write an excuse so I wouldn't have to sing, but she wouldn't do it. When in Rome, she said, do as the Romans do. What she meant was, don't make trouble, just sing. For a long time, I did. I sang with my fingers crossed, but I still felt like a traitor. Then one day I thought, if my mother and my father really and truly were in Rome, they wouldn't do as the Romans did at all. They'd probably try to get the Romans to do what they did just as they were trying to teach the Chinese to do what Americans did. My mother even gave classes in American manners. So that day, I quit singing. I kept my mouth locked tight against the King of England. Our teacher, Miss Williams, didn't notice at first. She stood in front of the room, using a ruler for a baton, striking each syllable so hard it was as if she were making up for the times she had nothing to strike. Miss Williams was a pinched face and bossy. Sometimes I wondered what had ever made her come to China. Maybe to try to catch a husband, my mother said. Puh, a husband, Miss Williams. Make him victorious, the class sang. It was on the strike of Vic that Miss Williams noticed. Her eyes lighted down on my mouth. When we sat down, she pointed her ruler at me. Is there something wrong with your voice today, Miss Jean? She asked. No, Miss Williams. You weren't singing. No, Miss Williams. It's not my national anthem. It's the national anthem we sing here, she snapped. You have always sung. Even Vera sings it. I looked at Victor Vera with the big blue bow tied on the top of her head. Usually, I felt sorry for her, but not today. At recess, I might even untie that bow, I thought. Just give it a yank. But if I had been smart, I wouldn't have been looking at Vera. 
I would have been looking at Ian Forbes, and I would have known that no matter what Miss Williams said, I wasn't through with the King of England. Recess at the British school was nothing I looked forward to. Every day we played a game called Prisoner's Base, which was all running and shouting and shoving and catching. I hated the game, yet everyone played except Vera Sebastian. She sat on the sidelines under her bow like someone who had been dropped out of a history book. By recess, I had forgotten my plans for that bow. While everyone was getting ready for the game, I was, as usual, trying to look as if I didn't care if I was the last person picked for our team or not. I was leaning against the high stone wall that ran around the schoolyard. I was looking up at a little white cloud skittering across the sky, when all at once, someone tramped down hard on my right foot. Ian Forbes, snarling bulldog face, heel grinding down on my toes, head thrust forward the way an animal might before it strikes. You wouldn't sing it, so say it, he ordered. Let me hear you say it. I tried to pull my foot away, but he only ground down harder. Say what? I was telling my face, please not show what my foot felt. God save the king. Say it. Those four words. I want to hear you say it. Although Ian Forbes was short, he was solid and tough and built for fighting. What was more, he always won. He had only to look at his bare knees between the top of his socks and his short pants to know he would win. His knees were square, bony, and unbeatable. So, of course, it was crazy for me to argue with him. Why should I? I asked. Americans haven't said that since George III. He grabbed my right arm and twisted it behind my back. Say it, he hissed. I felt the tears come to my eyes, and I hated myself for the tears. I hated myself for not saying in Rome, like my mother told me. I'll never say it, I whispered. They were choosing sides now in the schoolyard, and Ian's name was being called, among the first, as always. He gave my arm another twist. You'll sing tomorrow, he snarled, or you'll be bloody sorry. As he ran off, I slid to the ground, my head between my knees. Oh, Grandma, I thought, why can't I be there with you? I'd feed the chickens for you. I'd pump the water from the well the way my father used to. It would be almost two years before we'd go to America. I was 10 years old now. I'd be 12 then. But how could I think about years? I didn't even dare to think about the next day. After school, I ran all the way home, fast, so I couldn't think at all. Our house stood behind a high yellow. Our house stood behind a high stone wall, which had chips of broken glass sticking up from the top to keep thieves away. I flung open the iron gate and threw myself through the front door. I'm home, I yelled. Then I remembered it was Tuesday, the day my mother taught an English class at the YMCA, where my father was the director. I stood in the hall, trying to catch my breath, and as always, I began to feel small. It was a huge hall, with ceilings so high as if they would have nothing to do with the people. Certainly not with a mere child, not with me, the only child in the house. Once I asked my best friend, Andrea, if the hall made her feel little too. She said no. She was going to be a dancer and she loved space. She did a high kick to show how grand it was to have room. Andrea Hall was a year older than I was and knew about everything sooner. She told me about commas, for instance, long before I took punctuation seriously. How could I write, write a letter without commas, she asked. She made me ashamed that for months I hung little waggling comma tails all over my letters to my grandmother. She told me things that sounded so crazy I had to ask my mother if they were true, like where babies come from, and that someday the world, whole world would end. My mother would frown when I asked her, but she always agreed that Andrea was right. It made me furious. How could she know such things and not tell me? 
What was the matter with grown-ups, anyway? I wish that Andrea were here with me now, but she lived out in the country, and I didn't see her often. Lin Nai Nai, my ama, was the only one around, and of course, I knew she'd be there. It was her job to stay with me when my parents were out. As soon as she heard me come in, she'd called, Sai Lu Shang, which meant she was upstairs. She might be mending or ironing, but most likely she'd be sitting by the window embroidering. And she was. She even had my embroidery laid out, for we had made a bargain. She would teach me to embroider if I would teach her English. I liked embroidery. The cloth stretched tight between my embroidery hoop while I filled in the stamped pattern with cross stitches and lazy daisy flowers. The trouble was that lazy daisies needed French knots for their centers, and I hated making French knots. Mine always fell apart, so I left them till the end. Today, I had 20 lazy daisies waiting for their knots. Lin Nai Nai had already threaded my needle with embroidery floss. Black centers, she said, for the yellow flowers. I felt myself glowering. American flowers don't have centers, I said, and gave her back the needle. Lin Nai Nai looked at me, puzzled, but she did not argue. She was different from the other amas. She did not even come home from the servant class. She did not even come from the servant class, although this was a secret we had to keep from the other servants, who would have made her life miserable had they known. She had run away from her husband when he had taken a second wife. She would always have been wife number one and the boss, no matter how many wives he had, but she would rather be no wife than the head of a string of wives. She was modern. She might look old-fashioned, for her feet had been bound up tight when she was a little girl, so that they would stay small. And now, like many Chinese woman, women, she walked around on little stumps stuffed into tiny cloth shoes. Then Nai Nai were embroidered with butterflies. Still, she believed in true love and one wife for one husband. We were good friends, Lin Nai Nai and I, so I didn't know why I felt so mean. She shrugged. English lesson? She asked, smiling. I tested my arm to see if it still hurt from the twisting. It did. My foot, too. What do you want to know? I asked. We had been through the polite phrases. Please, thank you. I beg your pardon. Excuse me. You're welcome. Merry Christmas, which she had practiced but hadn't had a chance to use since this was only October. If I meet an American on the street, she asked, how do I greet him? I looked her straight in the eye and nodded my head in a greeting. Sewing machine, I said. You say sewing machine. She repeated it after me, making the four syllables into four separate words. She got up and walked across the room, bowing and smiling. Sewing machine. Part of me wanted to laugh at the thought of Lynn Nai Nai maybe meeting Dr. Carhart our minister, whose face would surely puff up the way it always does when he was flustered. But part of me didn't want to laugh at all. I didn't like it when my feelings got tangled, so I ran downstairs and played chopsticks on the piano, loud and fast. When my sore arm hurt, I just beat the keys harder. Then I went to the kitchen to see if Yang Tsi Fu, the cook, would give me something to eat. I found him reading a Chinese newspaper, his eyes going, up and down the characters. Chinese words don't march across flat surfaces the way ours do. They drop down cliffs, one cliff after another, right to left across a page. Can I have a piece of cinnamon toast, I asked, and a cup of cocoa? Yang Sifu grunted. He was smoking a cigarette, which he wasn't supposed to do in the kitchen, but Yang Sifu did mostly what he wanted. He considered himself superior to the common workers. You could tell because of the fingernails on his pinkies. They were at least two inches long, which was his way of showing that he didn't have to use his hands for rough or dirty work. He didn't seem to care that the fingernails were dirty, but maybe he could to keep such long nails clean. He made my toast while his cigarette dangled out of the corner of his mouth, collecting a long ash that finally fell on the floor. 
He wouldn't have kept smoking if my mother had been there, although he didn't always pay attention to my mother. Never about butter, butter pagodas, for instance. No matter how many times my mother had told him before a dinner party, no butter pagoda, it made no difference. As soon as everyone was seated, the serving boy, Wang Zifu, would bring in a pagoda and set it on the table. The guests would ooh and ah, for it was a masterpiece. A pagoda molded out of butter, curved roofs rising tier upon tier, but my mother could only think of how unsanitary it was. For of course, Yang Tsifu had molded the butter with his hands and the carved the decorations with one of his long fingernails. Still, we always used the butter, for if my mother sent it back to the kitchen, Yang Tsifu would lose face and quit. When my toast and cocoa were ready, I took them upstairs to my room, the blue room, and while I ate, I began Sarah Crew again. Now, there was a girl, I thought, who was worth crying over. I wasn't going to think about myself or Ian Fo Forbes or the next day. I wasn't. I wasn't. And I didn't. Not all afternoon. And not all evening. Still, I must have decided what I was going to do because the next morning, when I started for school and came to the corner where the old man sold hot chestnuts, the corner where I always turned to go to school, I didn't turn. I walked straight ahead. I wasn't going to school that day. I walked toward the Yangtze River, past the store that sold the paper pellets that opened up into flowers when you dropped them in a glass of water, then up the block where the beggars sat. I never saw anyone give money to a beggar. You couldn't, my father explained, or you'd be mobbed by beggars. They'd follow you every place. They'd never leave you alone. I'd learned not to look at them when I passed, and yet I saw the running sores, the twisted legs, the mangled faces. What I couldn't get over was that, like me, each one of those beggars had only one life to live. It just happened that they had drawn rotten ones. Oh, Grandma, I thought, we may be far apart, but we're lucky, you and I. Do you even know how lucky? In America, do you know? This part of the city didn't actually belong to the Chinese, even though the beggars sat there even though the upper-class Chinese lived there. A long time ago, other countries had just walked into China and divided up parts of Hangzhou and other cities into sections, or concessions, which is what they called their own, and used their own rules for governing. We lived in the French concession, on the Rue de Paris. Then there was the British concession and the Japanese. The Russian and German concessions had been officially returned to China, but the people still called them concessions. The Americans didn't have one, although like some of the other countries, they had gunboats on the river. In case, my father said. In case what? Just in case, that's all he'd say. The concessions didn't look like the rest of China. The build buildings were solemn and orderly with little plots of grass around them. Not like those in the Chinese part of the city, a jumble of rickety shops with people, vegetables, crates of quacking ducks, yard goods, bamboo baskets, and mangy dogs spilling out onto a street so narrow it was hardly there. The grandest street in Hengkau was the Bund, which ran along beside the Yangtze River. When I came to it after passing the beggars, I looked to my left and saw the American flag flying over the American consulate building. I was proud of the flag, and I thought maybe today it was proud of me. It flapped in the breeze as if it were saying, ha ha, to the King of England. Then I looked to the right at the customs house, which stood at the other end of the Bund. The clock at the top of the tower said 9.30. How would I spend the day? I crossed the street to the promenade, part of the Bund. When people walked there, they weren't usually going anyplace. They were just going out for the air. My mother sat, would wear her broad-brimmed hat, beaver hat, when we came, and my father would swing his cane in that jaunty way, which showed that he was glad to be a man. I thought I would just sit on the bench for the morning. I'd watch the customs house clock, and when it was time, I'd eat the lunch I'd brought along in my school bag. I was the only one sitting on the bench. 
people did, did not generally take the air on a Wednesday morning, and besides, not everyone was allowed there. The British had put up a Chinese on the Bund. The British had put up a sign on the Bund, no dogs, no Chinese. This meant that I could never bring Lin Nai Nai with me. My father couldn't even bring his best friend, Mr. T. K. Hu. Maybe the British wanted a place where they could pretend they weren't in China, I thought. Still, there were always Chinese coolies around. In order to load and unload boats on the river, coolies had to cross the Bund. All day they went back and forth, bent double under the loads, sweating and chanting in a tired, sing-song way that seemed to get them from one step to the next. To pass the time, I decided to recite poetry. The one good thing about Miss Williams was that she made us learn poems by heart, and I like that. There was one particular poem I didn't want to forget. I looked at the Yangtze River and pretended all the people in the boats were my audience. Breathes there the man with no souls, with a soul so dead, I cried, who never to himself has said, this is my own, my native land. I was so carried away by my performance that I didn't notice the policeman until he was right in front of me. Like all the policemen in the British concession, he was a bushy bearded Indian with a red turban wrapped around his head. He pointed to my school bag. Little miss, he said, why aren't you in school? He was tall and mysterious looking, more like a character in my Arabian Nights book than a man you might expect to talk to. So I fumbled for an answer. I'm, I'm, I'm going on an errand, I said finally. I just sat down for a rest. I picked up my school bag and walked quickly away. When I looked around, he was back on his corner, directing traffic. So now they were chasing children away too, I thought angrily. Well, I'd like to show them. Someday I'd like to walk a dog down the whole length of the Bund, a Great Dane. I'd have him on a leash, like this. I put out my hands, as if I were holding a leash right then. And he'd be so big and strong, I'd have to strain to hold him back. I strained. Then, of course, sometimes he'd have to stop to do his business, and I'd stop, like this, right in the middle of the sidewalk and let him go to it. I was so busy with my Great Dane, I was at the end of the Bund before I knew it. I let go of the leash, clapped my hands, and told the dog to go home. I left the Bund and the concession and walked into the Chinese world. My father and mother and father and I had walked there, but not for many months. This part near the river was called the Mud Flats. Sometimes it was muddier than others, and when the river flooded, the flats disappeared underwater. Sometimes even the fishermen's huts were washed away, knocked right off their long-legged stilts and swept down the river. But today, the river was fairly low, and the mud had dried so it was cracked and cakey. Most of the men who lived there were out fishing, some not far from the shore, poling their sampans through the shallow water. Only a few people were on the flats. A man cleaning fish on a flat rock at the water's edge, a woman spreading clothes on the dirt to dry, a few small children. But behind the huts was something I had never seen before. Even before I came close, I guessed what it was. Even then, I was excited by the strangeness of it. It was the beginnings of a boat, the skeleton of a large junk, its ribs lying bare, its backbone running straight and true down to the bottom. The outline of the prow was already in place, turning up wide and snub-nosed the way all junks did. I had never thought of boats starting from nothing, of taking on bones under their bodies. The eyes, I suppose, would be the last thing added. Then the junk would have life. The builders were not there, and I was behind the huts where no one could see me as I walked around and around, marveling. Then I climbed inside, and as I did, I knew that something wonderful was happening to me. I was a tingle the way a magician must feel when he swallows fire, because suddenly I knew that the boat was mine. No matter who really owned it, it was mine. Even if I never saw it again, it would be my junk sailing up and down the Yangtze River.
My junk, seeing the river sights with its two eyes, seeing them for me, whether I was there or not. Often, I had to put up, put the Yangtze River into a poem so I could keep it. Sometimes I had tried to draw it, but nothing I did ever came close. But now, now I had my junk, and somehow that gave me the river too. I thought I should put my mark on the boat, perhaps on the side of the spine, very small. A secret between the boat and me. I opened my school bag and took out my folding pen knife that I used for sharpening pencils. Very carefully, I carved the Chinese character that was our name, Gao. In China, my father was Mr. Gao, my mother was Mrs. Gao, and I was little Miss Gao. The builders would paint right over the character, I thought, and never notice. But I would know. Always and forever, I would know. For a long time I dreamed about the boat, imagining it finished, its sails up, its eyes wide. Someday it might sail all the way down the Yangtze to Shanghai. So I told the boat what it would see along the way, because I had been there and the boat hadn't. After a while, I got hungry and ate my egg sandwich. I was in the midst of peeling an orange when all at once I had company. A small boy, not more than four years old, wandered around to the back of the huts, saw me, and saw, stopped still. He was wearing a ragged blue cotton jacket with a red cloth pincushion-like charm around his neck, which was supposed to keep him from getting smallpox. Sticking up straight from the middle of his head was a small pigtail, which I knew was to fool the gods and make him think he was a girl. The gods didn't bother much with girls. It was boys that were important in China. The weather was still warm, so he wore no pants, nothing below the waist. Most small boys went around like this, so when they had to go, they could just let loose and go. He walked slowly down the boat and stared at me and then nodded as if he'd already guessed what I was. Foreign devil, he announced gravely. I shook my head. No, I said in Chinese. American friend. Through the ribs of the boat, I handed him a segment of the orange. He ate it slowly, his eyes on the rest of the orange. Segment by segment, I gave it all to him. Then he wiped his hands down the front of his jacket. Foreign devil, he repeated. He repeated. American friend, I corrected. Then I asked him about the boat. Who was building it? Where were the builders? He pointed with his chin upriver. Not here today, back tomorrow. I knew it would only be a question of time before the boy would run off to alert the people in the huts. Foreign devil, foreign devil, he would cry. So I put my hand on the prow of the boat, wished it locked, and climbing out, I stared, started back toward the bund. To my surprise, the boy walked beside me. When we came to the edge of the bund, I squatted down so we could be on the same eye level. Goodbye, I said. May the river god protect you. For a moment, the boy start, stared. When we spoke, it was as if you were trying out a new sound. American friend, he said slowly. When I looked back, he was still there, looking soberly toward the foreign world to which I had gone. The time, according to the custom house clock, was five after two, which meant that I couldn't go home for two hours. School was dismissed at 3.30, and I was home by 3.45, unless I had to stay for talking in class. It took me about 15 minutes to write, I will not talk in class 50 times, and so I often came home at 4 o'clock. I wrote up and down the Chinese, like the Chinese, 50 eyes, 50 wills, right through the sentence, so I never had to think about what I was writing. It was as if I were making a promise. Today, I planned to arrive home at 4, my staying in time, in the hope that I wouldn't meet classmates on the way. Meanwhile, I wandered up and down the streets, in and out of stores. I weighed myself on the big scale in the Hong Kao dispensary and found that I was as skinny as ever. I went to the Terminus Hotel and tried out the chairs in the lounge. At first, I didn't mind wandering around like this. Half my mind was still on the river with my junk. But as time went on, my junk began slipping away until I was alone with nothing but questions. 
would my mother find out about today? How could I skip school tomorrow and the next day and the next? Could I get sick? Was there a kind of long lie bed sickness that didn't hurt? I arrived home at four, just as I had planned. Open the door and called out, I'm home, cheery like and normal. But I was scarcely in the house before Lin Nai Nai ran to me from one side of the hall and my mother from the other. Are you all right? Are you all right? Lin Nai Nai felt my arms as if she expected them to be broken. My mother's face was white. What happened? She asked. I looked through the open door into the living room and saw Miss Williams sitting there. She had beaten me home and asked about my absence, which of course had scared everyone. Now my mother could see that I was in one piece, and for some reason this seemed to make her mad. She took me by the hand and led me to the living room. Miss Williams said you weren't in school, she said. Why was that? I hung my head, just the way cowards do in books. My mother dropped my hand. Jean will be in school tomorrow, she said firmly. She walked Miss Williams to the door. Thank you for stopping by. Miss Williams looked satisfied in her mean, pinched way. Well, she said, ta-ta. She always said ta-ta instead of goodbye. Chicken language, it sounded like. As soon as Miss Williams was gone and my mother was sitting down again, I burst into tears. Kneeling on the floor, I buried my head in her lap and poured out the whole miserable story. My mother could see that I wasn't really in one piece after all, so she listened quietly, stroking my hair as I talked. But gradually, I could feel her stiffen. I knew she was remembering she was a mother. You better go up to your room, she said, and think things over. We'll talk about it after supper. I flung myself on my bed. What was there to think? Either I went to school and got beaten up, or I quit. After supper, I explained to my mother and father how simple it was. I could stay at home and my mother could teach me the way Andrea's mother taught her. Maybe I could even go to Andrea's house and study with her. My mother shook her head. Yes, it was simple, she agreed. I had to go back to the British school, be sensible, and start singing about the king again. I clutched the edge of the table. Couldn't she understand? I couldn't turn back now. It was too late. So far, my father had not said a word. He was leaning back, teetering on the two hind legs of his chair, the way he always did after a meal, the way that drove my mother crazy. But he was not the kind of person to keep all four legs of a chair on the floor just because someone wanted him to. He wasn't a turning back person, so I hoped maybe he would understand. As I watched him, I saw a twinkle start in his eye, and suddenly he brought his chair down, slamming flat on the floor. He got up in motion for us to follow him into the living room. He sat down on the piano and began picking out the tune for God Save the King. Big help, I thought. Was he going to make me practice? And then he began to sing. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. Of course, it was the same tune. Why hadn't I thought of that? Who would know what I was singing as long as I moved my lips? I joined in now loud and strong. Of thee I sing. My mother laughed in spite of herself. If you sing that loud, she said, you'll start a revolution. Tomorrow I'll sing softly, I promised. No one will know. But for now, I really let freedom ring. Then all at once, I wanted to see Lin Nai Nai. I ran out back through the courtyard that separated the house from the servants' quarters and upstairs to her room. It's me, I called through the door. And when she opened up, I threw my arms around her. Oh, Lin Nai Nai, I love you, I said. You haven't said it yet, have you? Said what? Sewing machine. You haven't said it. No, she said, not yet. Still, I'm still practicing. Don't say it, Lin Nai Nai. Say, good day. It's shorter and easier. Besides, it's more polite. Good day, she repeated. Yes, that's right. Good day. I hugged her and ran back to the house. The next day at school, when we rose to sing the British National Anthem, everyone stared at me 
But as soon as I opened my mouth, the class lost interest. All but Ian Forbes. His eyes never left my face, but I sang softly, carefully, proudly. At recess, he sauntered over to where I stood against the wall. He spat on the ground. You could be gla bloody glad you sang today, he said. Then he strutted off as if he and those square knees of his had won again. And of course, I was bloody glad.